Welcome to another Blister Speaker Series at Western. Um, there are a few groups and people I want to thank uh, before we get started here um, for helping their coordination for the evening. Uh, I want to thank the Western Program Council. Uh, I want to thank the ICE Lab. Um, they have been an, a tremendous help. There has been a lot of heavy lifting logistically uh, to, to make this evening happen, and uh, so very grateful to the Ice Lab, uh, and thankful uh, to Campfire Ranch um, for providing the fire pits. Uh, Sam Dagenhard, thank you. Um, finally, and in a lot of ways mostly, I want to say thanks to all of you. Um, I have been paying very close attention to how things have been going on campus at Western, and I am so impressed uh, with the students and the administration and the professors here, and that you have managed to mitigate these COVID times so successfully, uh, I'm truly impressed and inspired, and please don't blow it now. Um, that would make me very sad, uh, but uh, Truly, we have been watching how things have been going here. We've certainly been seeing how it's been going in other parts of the country, and you all are doing an incredible job. And uh, I think in these times to try to still have things like this happen, but do it in a responsible way, um, that's certainly something that I've been interested in, and to see how successfully you all have navigated this uh, is a huge, inspiration and uh, you all deserve a lot of credit for that. So very well done, Western, very well done. Um, this evening, we have Cody Townsend with us. Um, Cody and I have been trying to make this happen for some time now. And, you know, we figured, well, let's just make it happen during a you know global pandemic. Like, let's, why do things easy? and. Uh, but it's so good to have Cody here. When we first conceived of the Blister Speaker Series and this ongoing outdoor industry series, Cody was literally one of the people at the very top of my list um, for reasons that I think will become clear to you throughout this conversation. Um, but he has literally lived a life in the outdoor industry. Uh, he has evolved, he has seen the industry evolved, and uh, I'm very excited to let him share some of his experience with you. Um, so Cody, first question, or first I should say, welcome back to the Gunnison Valley. Um, it's been a few years since you've been here? Yeah, um, been here with Matchstick Productions and shooting with them in 2014 for Days of My Youth. And then, as I was telling these guys, I actually came out to Western when I was 17, considering it for college. And that was my first, well, one of my first stops. And this was high, high on the list, but I ended up staying home in California just because, I don't know, I was lazy, as I was telling Jonathan. <laughs> he, he actually admitted to me he was a little afraid of the cold, which I, is kind of ironic now, but... Um, it's well, okay, we forgive you, and we welcome you, even if you used to be, you know, a wuss when it came to cold weather. Kind of still am, and okay. I'm from California. Yeah. <laughs> We're okay. used to the sun and warmth, and someone told me this was the coldest, one of the coldest average places in the country, and that definitely that terrified me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually want to get started with something that I don't know how many people know this. You studied linguistics in college. Let's just start there. We might as well, when you have Cody Townsend you should, in, in town, you should definitely start talking about linguistics. And so tell me a little bit about why on earth you picked that for your course of study. Well, there was two main reasons. And the first one was, again, a little bit out of laziness, um, <laughs> was I was actually going to, I started off at University of Nevada, Reno. I broke my femur skiing that year moved back in with my parents, started going to community college so I could just go to school locally, um, and it was a lot cheaper. Um, but then from there, I might, 
I set my sights on going to Haas School of Business at Berkeley, and it was, it's actually one of the single most difficult schools to get into. It's got one of the lowest acceptance rates, like lower than Harvard, and I was like, I'm going for that. Mm -hmm. And then I got done with my community college career, and they were like, okay, you need to be here for two more years before you get enough credits just to go into a four-year program. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm not doing that. And so I just started looking through a book and going, what do I pick? And I jumped into linguistics. And from there, I kind of didn't know exactly what I was going to be studying, and then I found it to be unbelievably fascinating fascinating in that here is something that we do on a daily basis. We talk like humans to each other, yet we actually know very little about it and we have no idea how it formed. Um, still to this day, like the three main theories of, of why we humans speak a natural language as opposed to a communication system like, uh, like there is in other animals and in computer systems is unknown. So as you started getting into it, you start to realize, you're like, whoa, there's this thing we utilize every day we know nothing about. And I always give these like couple anecdotes of like how fascinating it is. And one of these things is, um, it was in the 1960s, they found this, uh, this poor girl who was essentially locked inside her home and her father was deathly afraid of sound. So they never spoke a word in her entire life. She never heard radio, she never heard TV. The parents never spoke. This woman, this poor girl was never let out of the house. When she was discovered by Child Protective Services when she was like 15, um, they started to bring her in and realized she was like cognitively underdeveloped. And so they started to teach her, try and teach her a language, started to teach her English. She, in the course of the rest of her life, over the course of 45, 50 more years of her life, never learned more than 100 disjointed words, could never speak English. And so, but yet she was cognitively normal. She could do math flawlessly. Mm. She could do all kinds of other things, but she could never speak. And so it went into this whole theory that a lot of theories are coming up with now is that we speak a language and we develop a language like we grow an arm. Like it's something that's so naturally innate with us. And there's all these things you start to go into and you realize like it's pretty magical, our, mm. our ability to speak. And it all of a sudden got really deep into it and got really fascinated by it. So it, it was a fun major for sure. Um, one of the questions I had was whether you kind of got into just learning in general. Were you like the young kid, like hungry to read books and, you know, I don't know, watch smart films as opposed to like the dumb ones I was watching as a kid. But like, did the did the light bulb flip on for you pretty young or did that come later for you? I mean, if we're judging off what we watched, then it was definitely later because okay. I was a very big Beavis and Butthead fan Perfect. and Dumb and Dumber is still to this day my favorite movie. Okay. Um, so no, it was when I, I always think like when I was back in high school and uh, I did well in school, but it was always like, I just figured out a way to get mm -hmm. good grades because that seemed like the goal. It was like, oh, you're supposed to get A's. So I was like, all right, I'll figure out a way to get an A. And uh, I did that, but I never was like, the gifted students who were just naturally unbelievably smart and I just like got through it and it wasn't until college that I really like I don't know the, the learning environment of of a college and university and the way it challenges you and the way it makes you think was truly when I started to first be like oh learning is really fun um, I think high school you just kind of regurgitate information and college is when you learn how to process that and create new ideas hmm. yeah and we were having that conversation earlier that um, arguably neither of our respective courses of study are exactly what we're doing these days and yet we were just kind of saying that we wouldn't change that at all that that those courses of study really at least we think helped us think critically about the next opportunity the next interesting possibility in the rest and I think that is pretty important because I actually think that if we look at the course of your career and we see some of the moves you've made it kind of checks out given what you've said about you know, the kind of how that course of study for you um, has really impacted how you've moved forward like through the through your life and through the outdoor industry yeah no I think uh, as you were saying it was like kind of if you if you're going into engineering or you're going to be a doctor you might want to study those exact things but I think the rest of college just teaches you a way to think and I think like um, 
you know, studying linguistics, I'm not doing anything related to that as being a pro skier. And I remember even talking to my, um, the head of the department and he was like, are you coming back, get your master's and go into the field? I was like, no, I'm gonna go ski. And, but I'm really thankful for it because it was like the patterns of learning that you learn allows you to come into something as vague as trying to be a professional skier, which there is no map for that. There's no like, you work your way up through the system by starting out at this job level and you get promotions. Like you have to create your own career. So you have to like look at the, 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 the environment and the, the business opportunities you're in and create your own career. And so college, I think, helped set me up for that because you at least can look at things analytically and be like, hey, uh, that's how I got to do it and set my goals. I'll go through it that way. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit about the outdoor industry and ski industry maybe in particular, but how similar or different do you think the ski industry is today compared to when you were first breaking into it? Vastly different. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to, I guess when it comes to the most basic parts of our job, it is the same. Um, you know, at its very, very most basic core, we as a professional athlete are there to sell products. But you bake it down to it, and it's actually not quite that because ultimately one of the things I think what you try and do as a professional athlete is you try and inspire people, try and push the sport, you try to be creative, you try and create like a community around uh, around a sport um, because ultimately it's really hard to say like, you know, Seth Morrison has sold 1,000 pairs of skis this year. You can't do that. So uh, even though at its core it seems like that, a lot of it has to do with creating like kind of, I think, inspiration and creating, like I said, like me, um, content culture and like ideas about it. But from where it started of back in the day, you, you were in a ski movie, like an MSP ski movie, or you were in Powder Magazine, and that was your career. Um, you, I always say back then you had two people who just decided if you were gonna be successful or not. Um, and that was the ski movie editor and the editor of Powder Magazine. And those were kind of like, there was these massive gatekeepers to the industry. And for better or worse, um, now you have your own opportunity to create it. Um, we as athletes are now our own content producers, our own publishers, our own voice. We can kind of shape things the way we want to. You can pursue things the way you want to. You don't have to fall into what other people's ideas are, um, which I, I really respect. The, the hard part about it is, it's made the job a lot harder and a lot more complex. Like um, back in the day, all I'd have to worry about was how well I performed athletically on film or in front of someone else's camera. Now I own a bevy of camera equipment and sound recording equipment. I manage your own social media, I have to understand analytics, I have to understand kind of everything that goes behind content production and creating let's say an image, if you will. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely more difficult, but I also appreciate the difficulty because it allows you more freedom. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be a little caveat on what you just said. You don't have to do any of that. You just probably aren't gonna be in the position that you are currently in, right? And, and I mean, we've talked about, like, like you said, the good news is maybe there aren't just a, two gatekeepers there but there is a new era where a lot more is going to be required of any professional athlete, I think, in any industry to make a name, to keep it going in the industry, et cetera. And I, I, I don't know, I think people are getting a sense of that. I don't know if we're there yet or if, if some folks still think it's enough to just be great on a mountain bike and then I ought to, that ought to be enough. And I think you would say that's not enough no it's definitely not enough anymore we as i was kind of saying is like the almost the most basic level requirement is you're an exceptional athlete mm -hmm. now um you just if that's just to get your foot in the door you have to be an exceptional athlete and then from there you you kind of create your own success and to certain people like there's enough people that have made it and make a uh halfway decent living off it by not really uh, being their own content producers or putting much effort as, as maybe I do. Um, but maybe it's a little short-lived and that's the way they want to do it. But for me, it's like I 
I want to be a skier my whole life. I don't, this is what I love. And if I have to work a little bit extra hard at it to make sure that I can ski every day for the rest of my life, then that's what I'm going to do. So, so for me, I've made that choice and I, I've chosen to learn all the other aspects of it and try and try and create a career for myself. Yeah. I want to talk to you about social media. Um, I feel like we have had a pretty big shift fairly quickly where we've kind of famously maybe gone from a culture with athletes of, uh, as it was once famously put, like shut up and dribble or shut up and ski to now like we literally just watched LeBron James like win a title and seconds after winning he's being asked about social issues in this country and I'm curious someone like yourself who's got a pretty large social platform how you think about this shift how you navigate it and I, I take it you would agree this feels like a pretty significant shift from how it maybe used to be to how it is today. Is that fair? Yeah, it is a massive shift. It was, um, I wouldn't say there's an expectation to be an activist now, but in certain ways there is that little bit of pressure and I would say it's only, uh, it's only kind of community pressure if you are interested in, in those things. But from there, like, I think it's just more that there's freedom to be able to talk um, uh, like you want to talk or about issues that you're passionate about. Um, you know, a lot of people look at pro skiers and, um, you know, I was probably guilty of it when I was young too. They'd look at them and it's like, oh, they're superheroes and they're like, like living this rock star life. And, and it's, it's, a, it's another job. It's an amazing job, but it is a job. And we do, we are like, uh, it's almost like being a professional athlete these days is kind of in the way that I do it, is almost like a gig economy, like working for a uh, Uber driver. You just kind of, you have to create your own, uh, your own business plan and seek out your own people to give rides, but you have to seek out your own sponsors and whatnot. So like, um, oh, with that, like we're, normal people as, as well. We have our own viewpoints of the world and should be able to say what we want to say. I also think we shouldn't have to say everything. It shouldn't have to be a comment on every issue or aspect of life because to me, it, it, like having regurgitated information that you're not passionate about or not an expert in is just kind of useless. There's better people to listen to that. But if there is things like, you know, climate change is a in, in the ski world is obviously very impactful to skiers, to our mountain communities. And you see a lot, a lot of skiers speak about it because they're learning about it, they're living it, they're being out in the field with it. And you know, if that is one, it's gonna affect your career, it's gonna affect your, your passion for your sport and it's gonna affect your mountain community, then yeah, you should be able to speak about that. And um, I, I mean, for me, I see it as like a balance, like, you know, ultimately, the reason I have a platform is because you're a skier and people seeking you out for entertainment in some sort of way. But if there's something that's also, you're also a human and they are maybe following you because they like the way you talk or they like the way you uh, approach a sport. So then at that point, you're gonna talk about some of the things you're passionate about. And for me, like, yeah, I will talk about a few of the things. I'm not gonna comment on everything because I don't feel there's certain issues that I'm not, I'm not an expert in or no, have in-depth knowledge about. And I don't think there should be a pressure to, um, to talk about those things. You know, I saw some stuff over the last six months where people were calling out certain brands in the outdoor industry or certain athletes for not coming out with a statement. And you're like, well, you know, I personally, after the, the George Floyd um, incident and protests, like I didn't speak out about it for a couple weeks. Um, I happened to be on a trip, but I also was, I went back and was just reading, you know. I really wanted to uh, like listen to what the experts, the people that were talking passionately about this and wanted to learn from them before you speak anything because it's not something in my life that I was, have ex experience nor expertise in, but I'm gonna try and learn from it. So that's where there's this balance where you, you should be able to speak about things you're passionate about, but not the pressure to have to speak about everything. Mm -hmm. And I guess just to recap that, so 
in general, the different brands you work with, you're saying they're generally not coming to you to say, hey, you should weigh in on this or that. No. Okay. Yeah, no, I did, I've never had a single brand put any pressure to talk about it, nor have I seen any brand punish any athlete for speaking out about it. I've seen some people talk like that, but for the most part, like, I would say, like, professional skiers and outdoors people are kind of voices for you guys out in the audience for the, the mountain communities and then the brands that are developed in these mountain communities all kind of share very similar passions so in, in the same way I generally see the the brands you work with are kind of aligned with you in general because it's just kind of part of the the, the community that we all live in this question is actually a kind of a bit of a follow-up question from like I think three years ago we were talking about some of the various social media platforms and I think at the time I was kind of going off on Twitter and how I hated it and it was my least favorite of all the platforms and I still remember and I think about it all the time because I'm still not a big Twitter fan but you were like actually that's my favorite and I'm curious if you still feel that way if that's changed at all um, yeah, I, w I was telling, you know, like, I think social media in general is changing, and I think uh, there are certain parts of it that you kind of get sick of. It's also my job to be on social media, so maybe that's why I'm a little sick of it. But if I had to get rid of all social medias except for one, it would be everything but Twitter, just mainly because I'm, like, I don't know, a news and information kind of guy, and I think that's a, it's a there's ideas shared on there as opposed to just, I don't know, Instagram, some of the, the – it feels a little – um, self-aggrandizing it feels a little just like self-obsessed and it feels kind of stale in a certain way to me um, it's fun but it's like kind of it's it's a candy bar versus like a, a good meal um, Twitter has its own obviously <laughs> toxicity yeah. to it but for the most part I, I would rather be able to follow people that maybe don't believe in the things I do but I can hear their takes on it read articles from them um, you know, get your news and information from the day and like almost like an RSS style feed. Young people probably don't know what RSS feeds no, are. No, that just went say. way over their heads. Yeah, totally. That's all right. Um, mentors. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get into, we're gonna talk about the 50 Project. Um, we're gonna talk about Arcade, the company you co-founded. Um, and so I'll ask this kind of in that broader context of like everything that you've kind of been involved with but if I ask you to name one or two people who kind of stand out as mentors for you who comes to mind and what did they teach you yeah I would say there's like every kind of stage of I guess if you put it into your like sports career and athletic career I've had mentors um you know, from the earliest age, it was this guy, Tom Ways, at, a, at the, he's a professional skier, he's a ski patrol, and now he's a guide. Um, but I remember when I was like 15 and just skiing in the ski resort, skiing Squaw Valley, and him being like, looking at my best friend and I being like, hey, you kids, come ski with me, and just like all of a sudden teaching us things. And then from there, the two mentors I've really looked up to the, the most um, is probably Mike Douglas and Chris Davenport. And, um, I think because I saw two guys be create careers out of skiing. And to me, that was a dream to be able to make a living off doing something as fun as skiing. And here's two guys that are still to this day, professional skiers. And Douglas is 51 years old and uh, Davenport's right on his heels. And I'm like, it's just, it's amazing to think that you could live your whole life as a skier um you know we're in an age of sport where all of a sudden there's people breaking these barriers of of age um being like tom brady um you know lebron james yeah. being in his 17th year so it's becoming more normalized but for the most part like being a professional skier is really rough on your body and it it hurts a lot and you you beat yourself up and um you know the injuries start to start to really stack up and your drive and desire starts to kind of get hampered by that so um being able to adapt your career adapt what your focus and your passion is to be able to continue a career to be able to 
do something as wild as people pay you to go skiing, I think was, was really inspiring. And I just really kind of looked up to those guys and listened to what they had to say on how to, how to make it in this industry. Hmm. Um, I'd like to hear you talk a bit about arcade. Um, you, you know, you keep calling yourself a pro skier, which you are, but I keep thinking like you do a lot of other stuff than like say just that. So um, talk a bit about that experience of starting up this company, maintaining a company, growing a company, um, thoughts. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, one of the benefits of being a skier is you do have an off season. And um, I remember when I was, I was often waiting tables and working in restaurants in the off season, and I just started to eclipse that being able to make enough money to live through the season. And, um, you know, in that time, you always kind of think about starting a business, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's probably a dream a lot of us have shared at some, or had at some point of like starting your own business and owning your own, but I never really had an idea for it. And then, you know, play around with things. And then it was my roommate um, at the time, we were just talking about starting businesses. And he had just got a job turned down at Armada and he was all kind of fired up and he started talking about belts. And he was like, yeah, he's like, why don't, he's like, we put like leather belts from our jeans under our ski pants, that doesn't work. And I was like, yeah, that's right, and it sucks. They break down and I've got this nylon web belt, Boy Scout style belt that I was always popping open and shredded. I was like, yeah, wait. We buy thousands of dollars worth of equipment, yet we just put on a belt from our jeans onto our, it's like, why don't we make something that's a little bit better? Like something that's stretchy and comfortable built for skiing. And it was truly like, you have that like, aha, this is, yeah, we're, let's do this. And uh, pretty much, for, I still remember that conversation in our, on, in our living room on the couch and started off from there, which was, uh, has been an, a business school education because we started off absolutely knowing nothing about business. I thought I knew a lot being like, oh, I'm in marketing meetings with like Solomon and uh -huh. stuff, but really knew nothing about it. And uh, we uh, put $5,000 in. We s took about a year to figure out webbing, we sourced a webbing, and then we started hand sewing buckles on in our living room, made uh, 500 belts and sold them to one shop in, in Tahoe and they sold out in seven weeks and then since then arcade was born we were like okay i guess this is gonna work it was like a tiny little experiment we're like okay we'll pull up our money and see if it goes if it fails whatever but it worked and now we're 10 years in yeah and so when you are trying to juggle being a pro skier and showing up in places when they tell you to to shoot stuff or trying to tick off a different big line or something. And then also having to worry about this business thing. Do you enjoy having those two things? Or are you sometimes like, I, my life would be just simpler if I got to only focus on one of these? How does, how does that work for you? Well, I would say there was points where I was like, my life would be simpler if I was just waiting tables again, because this is really stressful. Uh, but at the same time, it was like there was obviously a desire and a passion there. So I did enjoy the, the, the challenge of it. And early on, it was actually beneficial because I, we were a small company. I had, you know, enough, a little bit of budget to travel around as a pro skier and I would go into shops on my, on my travels and be like, hey, do you want to buy these belts? And just kind of use my name and my, my travel budget to get in the door. Um, but yeah, no, it was definitely, it was hard because I was, it, it felt almost like when I was in high school or in college when it was like skiing all day and then getting home and then working till midnight, you know, trying to answer emails, trying to figure out how to run a business and whatnot. And, but I, I think I kind of relished that challenge um, till the point where I was working day to day for the company for the first five years of it. And then at some point realized it was like my, I could not balance being a pro skier and also um, running a business at the same time. And both were suffering because of it, because early season I was, I was in an office from 7 a.m. to 7 at night every day of the summer. And that doesn't set you up well athletically and mentally as well. So I ended up kind of uh, stepping back, um, hiring other people because 
I realized I couldn't hire people to be a pro skier for me, but I could hire mm -hmm. other people to work at a company for me and uh, went that route. And uh, first year was tough, I would say. It was definitely hard to separate from something you put so much uh, passion and energy into. But since then, now it's now it's really awesome. We've, we've got 13 employees and the company's doing great. And it's been it's it's really fun. Hmm. Let's talk about the 50 project. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about like just this thing from the first idea of it to the reality slash ongoing execution of this thing. Um, it, I would say, and I suspect you all would agree with me, now this seems like such an obviously great idea. Is that how it felt when you first had the idea? Like, oh, cool, yeah, this is definitely going to be a thing, or not so much? Yeah. I Well, when I thought of the idea, which was a pretty obvious idea, there's a book, and <laughs> there's like 50 You're just lines. you at and, the book? Yeah, you look at the book, and you just go like, well, those look like some cool lines, and then you find out, call Davenport, and be like, has anyone skied them all? He's like, no. You're like, okay. And then, so it's a pretty obvious idea, but um, the media side of it actually came a lot later, like two years on after having the idea to do it. Um, you know, immediately my brain did say, like, it's a great idea, but that was like the least of my concerns when I started going into it because as the ideas started popping up, like the book itself is very ski mountaineering focused and it's very, there's a lot of burly lines and they're all mainly accessed by foot. Um, there's three lines that are intended as heli ski lines, but um, for the most part, they're all, you, you gotta climb these lines. And at that point in my career, let's say 2014, 2015, 2015 was when I first started thinking about it, I had, you know, I was putting on crampons for the very first time that year and was picking up ice axes for the very first time and had no experience with ropes. And up until that point, I actually really did not like touring. Um, I, and I think it was a lot had to do with the gear and the availabilities and what I kind of liked out of uh, the performance of it. So it was a really daunting kind of thing to get over in my own mind just to like commit to something like that. I mean, I spent years thinking about it and I spent, I didn't tell a single soul except for my wife and we'd talk about it here and there because ultimately like I could tell that one, there's a reason why all 50 hasn't been skied. Like here's a super obvious idea, like very obvious, very clear, just like seven summits, you yeah. know, like, um, but why haven't like you know, then all been skied? And there's a lot of really talented ski mountaineers yeah. and far more fit and far more bold and far more gnarly than I am. Like, so what's, what's wrong here? And it took me like years of like studying the book and studying ski mountaineering and starting to dabble my foot into it and kind of start to figure out that whole world before I, I publicly committed to it and um, actually even personally committed to it. It was truly like, it was like the end of the winter of 2018, the project launched in 2019 that I was like, all right, this is what you're doing. Um, so yeah, there was, it, it, it took a long time to kind of think about it because it, it's truly a dangerous project. Mm -hmm. What's the most surprising thing you'd say you've learned along the way so far? Oh, um, yeah, that's tough. I mean, from the media side of things, um, that's probably been the biggest learning experience is producing your own video series and being like, not only like producing it, meaning like acquiring the money and the funding for it and putting together all the logistics of it, hiring the right people um, to then directing every episode and getting every episode out on time and in the way that you want it to do. That whole media side of producing mini ski movies on a bi-weekly basis has been a massive learning experience um, that I've actually really, really enjoyed and I've really learned how difficult and making ski movies and making movies in general is, I've gained just a vast amount of respect for people that make good films. And, uh, you know, here I'm making what I joke around, it's just like a YouTube vlog, and I think about how hard it is, and then you think about, like, the major Hollywood directors, like a Scorsese and stuff, mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, yeah, these guys are, 
are geniuses mm -hmm. because of what they can do. Um, and then from the ski side, um, I guess it's just, I do look at the 50 was kind of an, a personal excuse to learn more about this world. Like it was kind of like I wanted to ski the grand, but I didn't know if I necessarily had the, the techniques or knowledge to do it. So it was like, well, if you commit to this project, then you're gonna have to figure it out. And it was kind of that excuse to like, well, now you're, now you're gonna have to ski the grand because it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd like to have you tell the story, if you would, about talking about, like, you know, I, I probably do this same thing. Like, you drop a new episode, it's like, okay, Cody's skiing another big line. And then we kind of, or I, forget about everything else you kind of have to do. So it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, the guy, yeah, he skis gnarly stuff, but then he just probably goes and sleeps for 13 hours and doesn't do anything for multiple days till he goes and skis the next line. Turns out not quite true. Talk a little bit about when, which line was it you skied with Jeremy? Yeah. So yeah, I, what you're kind of getting at this, this story of like the work that goes into it uh, behind the scenes. And I try not to like, I don't like to talk about how much work this is. Yeah. No one wants to hear you as a pro skier with a dream life talk about how hard it is. But to give like an example of like, yeah, media production is really, really difficult and puts a lot of effort into it was, um, I don't know if you guys saw Peak Obsession, which was the movie we made with Jeremy Jones last year, which is when we did went up and climbed and skied Meteorite in Valdez, Alaska and Pontoon. And on Meteorite Day, um, we started at 1 a.m. Uh, we started hiking about two got back to the cars around seven at night. Um, so like 17 hour day and massive day beyond exhausted, totally floored. And as we, uh, I always tell people, I, I know we skied meteorite on a Tuesday because my schedule for episodes is coming out on a Wednesday. And I know that because I remember driving into Valdez, trying to go to the last restaurant that was still open by like 8.39, because it's Alaska in the winter, things close early. <laughs> And um, getting an episode on my phone and trying to review it from the editors, I mean, like, get the last minute revision. It's probably we've already three or four revisions deep at that point. Watching it, seeing some errors, some things I wanted to change. So then calling those guys and being like, this needs to change, this needs to change, this needs to change. And I ended up going back home to our lodge, way off, slow internet, waiting for the editors to finish it, then downloading it. Um, doing kind of the Photoshop for the thumbnails, putting together the press release, putting all the media package for sponsors out there, um, getting it up all online in a nice presentable package and waiting for it to actually upload again. And I was up till four in the morning after we were up at one in the morning, after we climbed Meteorite, trying to get an episode out because the episode was due at five in the morning, which was a self-imposed deadline, but I was trying to stick to that. And uh, if you've watched it in the movie, like I, wake up and I say it's oh surprise blue and could have got a little better sleep last night well that was why because I slept five hours and then the next day we went and climbed pontoon so <laughs> it's definitely been that that side of it was a little extra challenge than I that I brought onto myself besides just trying to do the 50 but but I'm stoked on it because it's like uh the way it's turned out the response has been really good and it's been just a kind of a cool journey to share yeah, and I think I, I totally hear you when you say, like, no one, I don't need anybody feeling sorry for me or no. anything like that, and we don't. Okay, good. But <laughs> I think it is important, this is a series about the outdoor industry, it is important that people understand the level of effort if you're going to actually pull this stuff off. It's actually not just about getting to the top and getting back down on that line it's a ton of of other stuff totally. and that's going on too and i think that there probably is a good moral there uh to the story for those of you interested in getting into this game the lines are cool staying up all night and then not sleeping enough and then going big again the next day i think those are the things that probably more of us should understand the the background work and ask if you want to put in that kind of an effort to make this sort of stuff happen yeah no I, I think that's like the is the kind of the moral of the story is that you, you 
don't necessarily the work that goes into it uh, that goes on to it, but there is that work that needs to be done just like a normal job. And it ultimately is, in many ways, a normal job. And you know, when it comes to this, like if you are producing something and you know companies are giving you money to then produce content or be represent their products you have to execute on what you promise them and for me like i hold myself to that standard where it's like if i'm if i told the sponsors hey my episodes are going to come out on wednesdays at 5 a.m and they start to expect that i'm not going to miss that deadline if that means i have to stay up till four in the morning after you climb up meteorite then that's what i'm going to do because i just want to I, you know, it's the whole over or under promise, over deliver, make sure that you are executing on everything. And I've seen it, you know, a lot of athletes struggle with that. And you, you, if, if you don't execute, then people aren't going to be willing to want to support you as you um, continue in the industry. And so it's something that I try and hold myself to is working really hard on it and executing on what you say you're going to execute on. Hmm. We're going to wrap up with uh, a few questions from you guys. Um, we asked for some submissions earlier and um, got a couple interesting questions in. And so very related question to what you've just been saying uh, from Alex. Um, so how do you go about getting funding for most of your projects? What is the best way to start getting funding for someone who is inexperienced with all of this? Mm -hmm. It, yeah, getting funding is definitely one of the hardest parts. And I see, you know, I've only pitched a few things in my career because it's like, it's pretty hard to try and acquire that funding. And I've spent years pitching something before it actually gets picked up. So it's something that you kind of have to just continually do and practice at. My thing with it is you have to show what you're going to deliver to someone for their money because a, no one just gives you $20,000 and be like, hey, I got this idea, like I wanna go do this, this, and this, and they're like, cool, here's 20 grand. Like it just doesn't work that way. You gotta say like, I have a video project, we're gonna be shooting on this, these kind of cameras. The person that is gonna be shooting it is this person. The person that is editing is this person. And try to explain to them in as much detail as possible what you expect. And even at that, like, there's an amount of educated guessing that goes into it. Like when I pitched the 50 project, I originally pitched the, the sponsors on, we were gonna get 500,000 YouTube views. And how did I come up with that? I was just, you know, I say to them 500,000 and then I held myself accountable. Um, luckily that first year we did 2 million, mm -hmm. which was a massive overshoot, but I tried to put it on a level being like, okay, if we can put out this many episodes and we can get 10,000 views, and that's based off of my other social media sponsors, what I expect, what I see other um, uh, videos of this kind do, like, I think we could do that. And you have to do those kind of educated guesses to pitch something to a sponsor in order for them to expect it. And the more professional you do it, the more it's in a nice PowerPoint presentation. Um, the more effort you put into it, the more chance you're gonna give yourself. Um, writing an email that's one paragraph long will never get you anything. You really, they won't, no one's gonna give you money for free. So you have to show them what value they're going to get off this. Um, and even, but the hard part is, I'm explaining it to just like, if you already have your foot in the door. Yeah. And getting your foot in the door is to me, one of these things where, you just you just show up and, um, you know show up to things like this show up to um, if there's events in your area movie premieres you go you know you guys have matchstick productions up here you get your foot in the door with them you go to OR show and just show up and start meeting people and you just kind of inject yourself into the industry just show up and you know start talking to people start meeting people and and it will slowly snowball over time um, you know the one thing I think we were talking about this earlier too is like don't ever expect anything to happen overnight. Yeah. Um, I always joke around um, the way that I feel my career has gone was, was the 10 year overnight success story. Uh, the crack and everything blew up, but I'd spent a decade in ski films and kind of just down, I felt like in B and C level before that. And so you just gotta kind of keep showing up and keep doing it. Yeah. From Dylan. <clears throat> 
are there any lines in North America that you think should be part of the 50 but are not? Uh, yeah, that's actually been a fun game of the 50 has been going through the book and being like, uh, mm, I don't necessarily think that one, but maybe, you know, what does this relate on the on what my interpretation of a classic would be? I kind of joke around like this is the most extensive and uh, dangerous book review on the planet. And <laughs> like my whole goal with it is to write like a three paragraph blurb for the New York Times. That's a book review on the, the 50 classic ski descents of oh, North America when it's all good. done. Um, but there is, you know, there's certain lines I'm like, no, I, I don't see it. Um, but then there are certain lines that I do see it, but I also see that as just like, it's actually more of a reflection of how much skiing has changed. Like the book is 10 years old and that seems like it's not that long ago, but w like in Canada, for instance, there's a, there's a couple lines up there, um, the, up on Mount Joffrey, which unfortunately collapsed as we kind of everyone saw it a couple of years ago um, or actually last year collapsed um, that line it's a cool line um, but to me up in Canada the thing that is the most prized line up there is this line called Mount Sampson and it's what all the like Pemberton locals and the Whistler locals aspire to ski one day and it's a massive giant spine line that you know every couple of years it comes in and couple every couple of years there's a few days that a couple of the gnarly locals go up and ski it and so like lines like that to me I want to see in there but I also see that as a reflection of the time like 10 years ago skiing that big of a spine line wasn't quite on a ski mountaineer's radar now it is um, and it was a little more couloir focus so um, I've those are the ones I, I think I've spent so much time in Canada I feel like there's some ones in Canada that I'd rather have in there so far for the rest of North America I've seen it be pretty accurate um, you know coming here to the Elks uh, uh, last year was like a revelation to me being like oh yeah the Elks are sick and now I see why North Maroon and Pyramid are in here like Pyramid is a legit amazing rad <laughs> line and that was like like a definite classic so um, it's been kind of cool exploring in a certain way mountain ranges that are pretty obvious but I never got a chance to go to yeah last two questions um, Ian asks uh, or says correct me if I'm wrong but the 50 project started with the realization that climate change would permanently affect and get rid of some of these lines so to raise awareness and with the clock ticking you had the, mo the motivation to begin and follow through with the project. Now with the current political climate and how far along you've come with the project, has your motivation evolved or changed at all? It was actually, it's almost a little backwards. Um, I would say the motivation for it started simply for the motivation of wanting uh, the personal desire to climb and ski these lines. They're aesthetic, they're beautiful, they're classics. Wanted to learn something about ski mountaineering through the process and, and go to places like the Tetons that I didn't get to ski a lot in. S what came from it was a little bit more realization of how quick climate change is acting. And one of the things that's it's hard to notice as like a kind of day-to-day -day skier and a uh, powder seeker is that climate change is affected things but when it comes to just like skiing pow like it really hasn't affected things we all still get pow days and maybe there's a little bit more um kind of extreme where certain years are just terrible in your region and certain years are like unbelievable like we're seeing higher highs and lower lows a little bit but for the most part like seeking powder isn't necessarily showing itself in what uh, what is happening with climate change but with these classic lines that's where I'm all of a sudden seeing it happen really, really fast. Because a lot of them are at the, you know, shoot up off the top of glaciers or rely on ice. And here we have photos that are 10, 20 years old, like pretty recent in the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing up to these lines and seeing that the Bergschrunds have grown so wide that they're becoming almost impassable. Um, that lines like the Watson Traverse on Mount Baker it's like that in a few years, maybe five, 10 years is done. Like we skied it and it was sketchy. It was the 20, it was a 25 degree slope. That was the most like fear inducing ski I've ever skied because it was just absolutely broken apart glacier mm -hmm. skiing like three foot bridges over 
thousand foot crevasses and it was like Bjarne and I skied it on a rope together. We were so terrified. Mm -hmm. And so it's more like that has come as like, now this is happening even quicker than we thought. And these lines in this book is going to be, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be obsolete in a few years. Um, so for me, it's just kind of, again, that awakening. Like, we know climate change is happening. Everyone, mainly because the scientists and experts are telling us. And then we're starting to see it anecdotally as outdoor community and skiers. But now seeing these classic lines, and it's really dawning on me, like, this, this sucks. This is, like, really, we're going to be losing a lot of, of the mountains and of skiing real quick here. Like, in my lifetime, I guarantee I'm going to see a, a, a season in Tahoe in my home with no snow. And we're going to see lines that were once classics and amazing that are never skiable again. And that sucks because, you know, you're like kind of opening up and I'm looking at a new generation who's getting into this. And I feel like I've been in this for a long time and I'm realizing even in my old age, it's going to disappear. And young kids are never even going to have the chance to do what we did. And here's a sport that you love and, and um, devoted your life to. And you're like, it might not exist in a hundred years and that's kind of it sucks and I mean that's just looking at it from the very narrow-minded like hey skiing is fun kind of point of view like obviously we know the other catastrophes that are going to happen to it and what it's going to do to our mountain communities is way worse than just losing skiing so that's more where it's come from um, and as far as like the, when it comes to the political climate yeah I think that's part of why people are speaking up a little bit more. I think we, we saw such a reversal in that when it came to climate change, when all of a sudden there was like, at least talk about it. Yeah, moving too slow, but at the federal level, it was like, hey, they're maybe doing something. And now all of a sudden we're like, no, now we're having the discussion whether it's real or not. Like, like we're having the discussion if like owls are real. Right. So, it's, so it is frustrating, and I think that's why so many people are talking about, talking about it. Last question um, from Michael. What keeps you coming back to the mountains? And how do you think we can help share our love for these sports in a positive and more inclusive manner? I think to me, like, I've been pretty fortunate. I grew up in like a beach town. I grew up surfing. I've done a lot, I've played a lot of sports in my life, but like skiing is to me like, the most amazing sport in the world because it's unlimited. Um, you know, we're you, we're talking just about LeBron James. He's him and I are the same age. He's doing the exact same sport and he's been doing it the same way for 17 years. And there's these little maybe subtle changes, like oh, they shoot a three point, more three pointers. But for skiing, like I'm a professional in it, and I started this project a couple of years ago, and I feel like I'm a beginner at it, mm -hmm. and. To me, like you can go through your entire lifetime of being a skier and be do something different every year. And even down to just like every turn is different and every then aspect of it is different. And you can kind of do it in so many different ways that you can do it from the point you're two years old till the day you die. Like you can ski until your 80s and 90s and still be enjoying it and in seeking out some new sort of way to do it. And to me, like, that's what keeps bringing me back is like, I felt like I've lived a career as three skiers already. It's like yeah. started off as a ski racer, then the free ride style of skier, big mountain skier, and now kind of ski mountaineering. And uh, I always tell people, I'll do my park career in my fifties. That's why <laughs> that's I'll get into park. Um, but, um, and then like how to like, how to share and be more open, you know, I know this is a topic and I've definitely thought about that side of it. That's where like the expertise you can bring in. And we do have some challenges. It's a very expensive sport. And um, I know I personally think we have to invest in getting more kids up here, like uh, kids that aren't necessarily from upper income brackets, like people that uh, affording opportunities to more people at a young age to get into the mountains, I think is the the only way the sport is going to survive. We continue to watch it um, be a, a more expensive, more exclusive sport, and the um, the more that we push the powers that be, the the companies, the the ski areas to 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 
make it more inclusive is the only way we're going to kind of keep it that way. Like we're, I feel like we're in a certain way starting from scratch again. Like it was, it was interesting going back east last year and seeing um, one of the biggest realizations of what I saw back east was like there's these mom and pop ski areas where you can get a lift ticket for $17 mm -hmm. and it's by our standards a tiny little terrible ski area and yet you still you see a, a dad in like a Carhartt jacket with their you know six-year-old son teaching his kid to ski and you're like that is special and that is awesome and that is the way the sport is going to survive and if we don't push for that in um, in our communities out here, then we're gonna continue to watch this sport get more exclusive, more expensive, and I don't think we we want it to go that way. So it's a it's a it's a massive problem, but I think it's you know like a lot of problems are uh, solved by forcing the issue and forcing the issue on the powers that be, and you know the people else. There's people out here actually have more power than one person at the top of a company, more power than they think. So hopefully we can kind of work on that. Hey, man, good having you out here. And thanks for being part of this series and coming to see our little community here. And uh, best wishes for this coming season. I know you've got some big, pretty scary things uh, you're probably looking to get on top of. And uh, be safe. And yeah, stay up all night to make sure those episodes are still coming out on time because we want to see it. But, yeah, um, yeah, but, but it is really cool. I appreciate you sharing um, all of these different things that you're thinking about and that you are invested in and the rest. And, and like I said at the beginning, um, one of the things I really value about you is I think that for people wondering about the outdoor industry and thinking about getting into it or whatever. It's like you've actually had, again, I know you call yourself a pro skier, but we didn't even talk about, I mean, sort of the product design or product development stuff. Like you've had your hand in a lot of different areas in these in this industry and, and will continue to, I know. So um, yeah, uh, really appreciate you coming and sharing your perspective. Well, thank you for having me. We'll just we'll talk about gear nerdery on Gear Thirty. Okay. That, that podcast. We'll okay. go to there. Then we'll we can go <laughs> deep dive into tinkering with stuff. <laughs> we will do that. Awesome. Okay. No, thank you guys. Um, thank you all for coming out. This is really cool. Never done a live podcast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. And good night.